Hi, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the final frontier. Uh, today, I'm told we have more accurate maps of the surface of Mars than we do the surface uh, than the bottom of the sea. Technology promises new ways to exploit the oceans as well at greater depths as well as with greater risks. Today we're going to talk about, sure, join me please, I'll introduce you. We talk about the immense potential of scientific innovation and some of the risks and opportunities that are presented along with it. Uh, my name is Sam Jacobs. I am Editor-in-Chief of Time. I'm thrilled to be here with you uh, with a number of esteemed experts on the ocean, uh, as well as a number of people who will be joined later throughout this conversation. Uh, we are particularly excited because our plan is to do a live interview from 7,000 kilometers away, but not just 7,000 kilometers away, 300 meters below the surface of the sea. Well, I will be talking to Diva Amon, the science advisor at the Benioff Ocean Science Laboratory at UC Santa Barbara, as well as Maddie Rodrigue, the science program director of Ocean X. We'll be joined later by Ray Dalio, the founder and chief investment mentor at Bridgewater Associates. Uh, but I'd first like to introduce you to the three uh, members of our panel today. Um, Starting to my left, Jennifer Morris, the Chief Executive Officer of Nature Conservancy. Then, Mr. Andrew, Morf Mr. Andrew Forrest, Chairman and Founder of Fortescue in Australia. And Dr. Deva Abora, the Director of Coastal Oceans Research and Development in the Indian Ocean. So, with that introduction, I'm going to get into it with our panelists. Then, Mr. Ray Dalio will join us, and then we will talk to someone 300 meters below the surface of the sea. Thank you very much for being here. Dr. Bohr, I'd like to start with you. Can you set the scene for us of what's happening? How much do we know about the ocean today? Uh, thanks, Sam, for, and for being invited here and, and having this podium. Um, you've already taken my first line, that we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the deep sea. That's, that's the standard answer we have. Um, but, you know, the deep ocean is very hard to explore. Science is very difficult uh, to access there. We've only described about 10% of the species in the deep sea, as far as we know, because, of course, we don't know how many species there are. Um, but having said that, it's incredible how much knowledge has been accumulated over hundreds of years by ships crossing the ocean, uh, dropping grabs down and picking things up. And the ingenuity of science in discovery uh, is really phenomenal. Life came from the ocean. It's our lungs or the planet. The buffer in the ocean really determines the chemistry of our cells, and it manages our climate. And we really need to understand the sensitivity and the wonder of the ocean in order to really deal with the challenges that we're facing with climate change and with, with trying to feed and sustain our planet in the coming years. One of the things we discussed prior to the panel um, is the difference in knowledge when it comes to different parts of the oceans. Can you, can you tell us about that today? What, where are the inequities when it comes to information? Well, there's a lot of disparities uh, amongst regions of how much we know uh, about the ocean. Uh, humans are a backyard species. You know, we invest in our space and where we are, and we, we need to get to know it. Um, there has been a lot of exploration to remote regions, um, but my region, or where the, where the submersible is now and the ship in the West Indian Ocean, is really one of the poorest known oceans in the world. Um, the countries surrounding uh, the ocean don't have much money to invest in the exploration, and so exploration of this sort is really critical to really improving our knowledge, because a lack of knowledge and disparities in knowledge really affect how well we make decisions about what we should be doing. <laughs> And the more we know, or the more even that knowledge is, is around the world, um, the better our decisions about what we should do, where, and why. It's very important for conservation. It's very important for climate change. The last thing I'll mention is that uh, the ownership of knowledge is a really important thing. And the representation of people in knowledge systems is a critical thing for making decisions. And I think Dr. Amon, who we'll hear from, uh, is a perfect example of that, how we're really uh, broadening the representation of scientists uh, from around the world um, and really getting more people involved in collecting information and making decisions on the basis of that knowledge. Dr. Forrest, and I robbed you of a degree earlier, so I apologize for that. Um, why are so many billionaires more interested in what's above us and what's beneath us? Oh, um, I just don't think they are aware of the criticality 
of the oceans. And, and look, I'm a, I'm a student of Stephen Hawking. Um, I, I, I'm completely enraptured with space. But there is nothing more important than our own planet. I think it's asinine to say um, when we destroy Earth, we should move to another planet. Um, I just think that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. It's a bit like saying, let the best intelligence win with AI and for, forget that it's humans who designed AI. Um, so I just think if you, if you look at the very big picture of life, then you appreciate that 98% of the livable space in the world isn't this thin veneer of atmosphere above the terrestrial environment, it's the oceans. And that the command, as um, you were saying, Doctor, of the environments is just so important from the oceans. And the oceans have been our biggest, biggest front line, our major battle winner against climate change, but even that is being overwhelmed. And I, I want to see that the great explorers like Jacques Cousteau, like um, this great man who's looking after us here, Ray Dalio, um, that they, they have a really pristine, beautiful ocean to explore and that the industrial world doesn't destroy it through just lack of knowledge. And so my incentive was to send myself back to, to university for four years, midlife, and, um, and I just can't think of anything more important that I've actually done. Speaking of the important work that, that you've done, you and I met yesterday uh, about a, one of the topics of conversation was a sort of an intervention, an arrival that you made at COP a few months ago. C can you tell us about that experience uh, and what, what sort of story you were trying to tell there? Well, just, just saying that uh, it is the industrial world, it's the industrial polluting world, which we must immediately turn to with a simple question, if you burn fossil fuel, we all do in this room, then uh, we should be asking industrialists, when are you going to stop burning fossil fuel? Simple question, when are you going to stop burning fossil fuel so that everyone in this room isn't forced to burn fossil fuel to live their lives? And if you're a fossil fuel producer, then the question is, when are you going to stop forcing your customers to burn fossil fuel, i.e. you market yourself as an energy company, then produce energy, give people the choice, green or dirty, and you know which one they're going to choose. So to really prove that point, we sailed the world's first green hydrogen ship into COP28, um, and, uh, and it got blocked at the 12-mile nautical border uh, because it's a pollution-free fuel. And it highlighted the fact that the world is so full of jargon and full of talk, but when you actually want to do something, the world isn't prepared for its pollution-free future. And that was, that was a real turning point. You know, um, we, we put global ads in the paper, follow the science. We put an ostrich with its head in the ground across all Dubai papers, across all the UAE, all the world, to say, here's a ship which is proven. You don't have to run on fossil fuel anymore. And if you don't respect the science, then you're no more than an ostrich with your head in the sand. Uh, Jennifer, we've had the, the, a, a, a little bit of perspective from science, a little bit of perspective from business. I, I'm curious if you and I could talk about the intersection between uh, people and the planet, or in this case, uh, the ocean. Um, what threats do these environments face? A lot. Um, thank you for the question. So maybe I'll just pick up on one thing, and, and I want to recognize Ray and, and sort of the, the adage that you have given to the world is that we don't value what we can't measure. And I would add with Dr. Sylvia Earle's comment of we can't, we don't see what's under the ocean. If we actually could see what we're doing to the ocean, we would actually measure it and value it in a much better way. So one of the things that you know, we're doing with many partners in this room is a real push to have a lot more onboard electronic monitoring on fishing vessels. We can do a ton of protection, and a lot of people in this room are doing that. 30% of oceans, we're all engaged in the High Seas Treaty and all these wonderful things. But if we trash the other 70% through improper fisheries practices, then that 30% is also going to be destroyed. And we know that we have to do a much, much better job when it comes to fisheries. So electronic monitoring is really important. Let me just give you a few statistics. In the Pacific Ocean alone, over a billion hooks are thrown every year in longline fisheries. Less than 5% of those ships have any form of independent onboard electronic monitoring. Less than 5%. 
And the, the amount of bycatch, and many in this room know that this is such a big, big, big problem, but we don't actually see it. So how do we get companies like Walmart, who've now signed up to say we want 100% electronic monitoring in our ships and, and, and all of our fisheries? How do we get countries to recognize this is good for them? Countries like Ghana, like the UK, who are now saying we must have eyes on the sea. This is happening, but it's not happening fast enough. And we all see this in spades. We see that if we, every time that we're, the fish, uh, a ship goes out, we know that there's going to be so hundreds of 100 million sharks a year in bycatch. That is unacceptable. We only see it when it's coming, when we have cameras on the ships and when we have some form of actual monitoring. But it's not enough. And I think it's up to all of us in this room, everyone listening online, to understand what we are doing to the oceans. It's absolutely critical that we have a lot more intelligence. We have the technology, but we've got to have the will to do it. It's also about social issues. The fishing industry is rife with slavery. There is so much, so many horrible things in terms of labor practices happening aboard these boats. Electronic monitoring can help that. AI can help that, and also the bycatch. But there's a lot of room for improvement there, and we're really excited to be part of this movement and to make it go even faster. Are there places where you're seeing success? Are there initiatives or, or locations that you're, you're truly excited about today? Yes, so several. Um, I mentioned some of the big companies signing up to this. I'll, I'll give an example of something in the Pacific that we're doing. Um, called Pacific Island Tuna, and it's working directly with, with the Republic of the Marshall Islands to basically repatriate profits from the, their tuna fleet. So they're getting very, very little money historically on, on tuna sales, and we came together with the Republic of Marshall Islands and created, kind of radical, but we created a joint venture between the Nature Conservancy and a government, a new company, that now is goal is to have 100% of the fish that are going there directly, the profits, the net profits will go back to the Republic of Marshall Islands. And our first customer, Walmart. So we delivered over 5 million, I think it's actually now 10 million, cans of tuna under a special label that's MSC certified and has 100% electronic monitoring on board. And those profits are staying in the country for marine protection. A lot of the, the money has to go into ensuring that there's dockside offloading and there's investments in communities. And this is what the, the countries in the Pacific need. They need to see more of that revenue stay in their countries. They're all, these, all these countries are dealing with such so harsh impacts of climate change, and if we don't allow them to have more revenue from what is often their biggest source of natural capital revenue, which is the fishing fleet, then they're not going to be able to invest more in their future. Uh, Dr. Abor, a similar question for you. Are there scientific discoveries or innovations today that you're most excited about? Oh, so I think um, so. the ability to measure, I think, is just the, the technology of being able to do that is, and the computational power to deal with that data is just amazing. And I think that will really transform how we can really translate our knowledge of nature and measure what's real in nature, you know, amount of fish or amount of coral, um, and really quantify it in, in real units for what it is, and then convert that into other indices. Sometimes it might be money and revenue. Uh, sometimes it might be other indicators that tell us about the health of the ocean. So I think that's really important. Uh, remote sensing, our ability to measure things from space, uh, is taking off. I think terrestrial uh, sciences and land management and conservation have been completely transformed by measurements from space. The challenge on the ocean, particularly for coral reefs, which is what I work on, is all the corals are underwater, and you have to deal with that layer of water in between. So there's, there's a a range of challenges that we have to face in terms of measurement, really addressing all of the questions we'd like to face in the ocean. Um, but then in water instrumentation, all sorts of technologies are developing now. The use of sound, for example, in measuring the health of coral reefs, the variety of sounds you get from a coral reef are absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think that is really transforming. And then, of course, the big uh, sort of the big challenge, the ocean is the largest part of the planet. Uh, and this issue of not having uh, eyes on board or eyes in the water is if we're going to really measure this last or track and monitor this last open ocean resource that we have, we really need to invest in these tools to be able to monitor what's happening there so we can ensure that as we get the legislation and the practices for really managing it well, uh, we'll be able to measure what's happening. Um. Uh, Dr. Forrest, a question for you. I think we've talked about how humans are largely a land-based species, um, and I think that means that what happens on the ocean is something that we rarely see. 
Uh, and I'm curious, um, from your perspective, if you could help this room understand the role that the oceans play in the global economy and, and, and the relationship between how business functions today and just how essential the ocean is to that. Okay, I'd have to say that the oceans right now, uh, their major role is the garbage dump of humanity. Um, and uh, as my friends on this stage have said, um, modern slavery is rife in the oceans. We, we have um, a foundation of which the largest modern slavery group is Walk Free. We are measuring this and we'll get a much better idea when we can monitor surveillance. These factory ships have forced labour on them and they never get to see the ocean, the, the land for years. Um, so I, I just know that, um, that if the primary role for oceans, if we're going to be brutal about it, is a garbage dump, then we're destroying our oceans uh, and we've got to stop overfishing, which will include slavery, because people move to slavery like subsidised fuel because the fish are running out. Mm. Um, we must stop non-compostable, and I repeat, non-compostable plastic entering the oceans because that is causing massive damage. Um, and of course, oceanic heat waves are way more severe um, in the marine environment than we have ever seen in the, in the terrestrial environment. So these, these issues are what's facing humanity to not destroy its biggest inheritance. And that inheritance provides all the ships, all the shipping routes. We have a huge amount of protein to at least one billion people who absolutely rely on it, and then the rest of us who would also suffer badly without it. Um, and that we don't have to do this. We can, we can monitor fishing. We can do much more land-based fish farming without fish-based fish meal. We can switch over to ammonia, green ammonia as a fuel where the only output, the only pollution is nitrogen, which that tree is relying on. These are all choices which we can now make. Now look, in the years past, maybe even a decade past, those choices weren't there. And nor was the science that we're going to whistle through two degrees if we're not very, very careful. And the suffering which that will bring back on humanity will be immense. So I see these huge problems, plastic, overfishing and global warming, as all arrestable by the same guilty party as is causing it. Um, and that is, that's us, humanity. And so the first thing I'd like um, everyone participating here is to hold industrialists to account. If you want to save these oceans, then please do it like this. Please say to every industrialist, when are you going to stop burning fossil fuel? When are you going to stop using non-compostable plastic to every food provider? Is your fish food and fish meal completely monitored? If not, we'll, we'll stop buying it. And of course, to fossil fuel producers, when are you going to stop forcing our hand to consume the only energy which you're giving us when you now have a choice? Renewable energy, yet you're still sticking us to fossil fuel. If you want to save the oceans, get out there and do that. Um, and then allow us to have children who wonder at the oceans like we are now. Jennifer, what tactics are you seeing that are most effective to motivating people towards solving those problems? Well, you know, I think the, the era of volunteerism needs to end. Um, what does that mean? Meaning that, you know, we've got some good companies out there that are doing nice things, but the scale of the problem is so immense, we have to see policy. We have to see better fisheries regulation. We have to see reform in the, the RMFOs. We have to, the, glo the High Seas Treaty is fantastic, and don't get me wrong, a lot of people in this room worked decades to get that done, but now it has to be ratified, implemented. So the scale of the problem is gonna require policy, and I just wanna make a, a, another comment related to, to, let's face it, the elephant in the room is how we price and value nature. Mm. And we are the subsidy situation in the fisheries, and everyone, whenever I say that word, they're like, oh, we can't do that, that's so hard. We have to be smart about evolving 
the way that we, again, value the food coming from the oceans, and we're doing it in a terrible way right now. We need to be subsidizing regenerative practices. We need to be providing the right incentives for, for ships to do this in the right way. And we need to make sure that there are the, the regulatory environments, not just from taxes and subsidies, but they can enforce this. And the, and the countries that are suffering the most are the ones that don't have you know, the access to boats. I mean, you, we go to a lot of these Pacific Island nations, and they're like, yeah, we would love to enforce that, but we can't even get out there. So what are we doing as a global community to really prioritize some of the key issues related to our, quite frankly, terrible relationship that we have right now? So there, there has to be an end to just the bright spot. Those are great, and those are lighthouse projects. We all love them. But time is running out, especially when it comes to the ocean biome. So we really need to encourage bolder action on behalf of all, um, of all countries and, and, quite frankly, provide alternatives for communities that are seeing a decline in their coastal fisheries, often as a result of too much fishing happening in, uh, in far, farther away from shore. Can I just, can I just wait in here? Yeah. Just to totally support you, Jennifer, each of these massive problems, global warming, uh, ship-based pollution, which is hideous, um, overfishing, plastic, they're fixable. They're fixable now. We know that about a measly five dollars, six dollar a ton on as a carbon price will push the shipping industry to want to use green ammonia, not the most disgusting fuel there is, which is bunker sea oil. We know that a small premium on polymer will push plastic from being a waste to commodity, where you just wouldn't think about throwing it out because it's got a value. And Monitoring, Jennifer's point about transparency, will fix global overfishing. So what we should be asking for is we can save the oceans. We've got these three weapons. We must demand industry pushes government to use them. I'm going to stop the panel there on that point. You're going to come back and join me uh, at the end of this conversation. Love to ask you to take your seats. Mr. Ray Dalio, I'd like to invite you up. Ray has many titles, but his connection here is to Ocean X. And, and Ray, I'd love for you to talk um, and tell this group why this vessel is in the Seychelles and, and what are you doing? Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, we're all partners in different ways and we all can bring different assets to bear. Um, and um, then we have to actually accomplish a great deal. And uh, uh, and so we're going to take you into the world so that you're going to get exposed to um, Ocean X's um, subs so that you can experience it. So now, why the cycle? Why did I get involved and what are we doing? Uh, when I grew up, <clears throat> uh, Jacques Cousteau had a big effect on my life. And then I became a diver, and then I saw it. And that awareness, um, when circumstances changed and I had enough resources, uh, allowed me to be in a position where I could get an ocean exploration vehicle and I could enable scientists such as those who are gonna be, you're going to meet here today to be on that ship. And then James Cameron said to me, um, well, uh, Jacques Cousteau brought to you the awareness and the love. Why don't you bring to the rest of the world the awareness and the love? And so I decided that I was going to um, make it not only an ocean exploration vehicle that's good for scientists, but also to bring it back to people such as you, you're going to experience here today. So <clears throat> what you're going to be um, seeing is uh, Ocean Explorer, which is this um, vessel that you'll just see a bit of, but it has labs and it's a fantastic vehicle for uh, the ocean exploration that we work with uh, scientists uh, uh, from oceanographic institutes. And then we also um, create um, educational programs such as the Young Explorers program so that young people can be on it. And now with modern technology, it, um, children in schools can actually control the vehicles that you're going to see, and it can take you anywhere. It has vehicles that will go down for 6,000 meters 
that will cover 98% of the ocean with cameras in front of them that have 3D, 360 degree cameras so that the kids from here can, uh, from their classrooms can basically look through those lenses or it could be brought to there. Unfortunately, we're not gonna give you the 3D, 360, but we're gonna take you into this world because I believe when we say, we need to do this, we need to do this, and we need to do that, that becomes very theoretical unless you ch produce change. And what is going to produce change but the love and the awareness of it? Um, our, on our earlier ship, about 40% of uh, Blue Planet 2 was shot from that ship. And that led to the UK government changing plastics laws and so on, and having an effect. We also discovered the giant squid. Millions of people watched the discovery of the giant squid. So I believe that doing the science and then also being able to show it and excite people so that people care and then they demand the things that we say we need to do is an important path. So I'm just gonna turn it over to the folks on uh, in the sub, I guess, is where we're going. Yes, Ray, thank you. Uh, this is a moment that Ray and many of these people in this room have been working a long and hard for. We're actually gonna have a live connection with Maddie Rodrigue, who's in the Seychelles on board an OceanX vessel. And she's gonna lead us in a conversation and introduce us to Diva Amon, I said, who uh, I earlier introduced you as the science advisor to the Benioff Ocean Sciences Laboratory. Uh, I should mention that Mark Benioff and Lynn Benioff, who sponsor this laboratory, are also co-owners and co-chairs of time. Uh, so Maddie, uh, I look forward to connecting with you. As I said, uh, this is traveling 7,000 kilometers and then 300 meters below the sea. Um, and so there may be some latency issues. When we do see the images come in, I want you to see there'll be two points of light. You'll actually see the vessel underneath the ocean as well as one that's following it and filming it at the same time. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Sam. Thank you to the entire panel. And hi, Davos. We're so happy to be here in this beautiful Seychelles. My name is Maddie Rodrigue, and I'm the Science Program Director at OceanX. And we are currently on board Ocean Explorer at the Aldabra Atoll. Aldabra is not only a World Heritage Site, but also a marine protected area. It took us over 60 hours steam to actually get here, traveling more than 1,200 kilometers. That's a long way, but we're really excited and it's really amazing to be here because so much amazing work has already been done in the ocean conservation space right here in the Seychelles. While we're here, we are honored to be working with local research partners, local Seychelles law scientists, conducting a groundbreaking scientific mission. We're on this mission studying everything from shallow to deep sea habitats, looking at biodiversity of creatures, large and small, and also looking at all of the other key elements crucial for our understanding of this marine environment. In a minute, we're gonna be headed to Mission Control, which is really the central nervous system of Ocean Explorer. That's where we pilot our remotely operated vehicles, we communicate with our submersibles, and we also create 3D maps of the seafloor, often in unmapped areas for the first time in history. It's also where we're gonna be going live to one of our submersibles, which is currently more than 300 meters below the surface. We'll get to all of that in a minute, but first, I wanted to introduce you to the Ocean Explorer. The ocean, vast, beautiful, vital. All life on Earth, including our own, depends upon it. Yet, it's a place that we barely understand, a place of mystery and unanswered questions. And the deeper we venture, the more there is to be explored. We believe it is vital that we understand as much as possible about the oceans, from the shallowest reefs to the deepest trenches. Ocean Explorer is the ultimate tool for that job. Equipped with the latest technology, dual submersibles, a helicopter, a remotely operated vehicle that can access 98% of the ocean floor, three onboard laboratories with real-time genetic sequencing capabilities, and the top experts in their field to operate them all come together aboard this vessel. The vessel serves as a platform for the scientific community, providing access to the most remote and challenging parts of the ocean and the tools to look deeper 
and closer than ever before. Through exploration and innovative storytelling, we can inspire the next generation of marine scientists and ocean lovers alike. Simply put, our mission is to explore the ocean and bring it back to the world. Welcome aboard. Welcome back to Ocean Explorer, where we are currently standing in mission control. It's almost time to go live to our submersible. The ocean is the final frontier on our planet, and human technology has advanced to the point where now we can explore every part of the ocean, even down to the deepest point. But as we continue to explore, we truly realize that there's no place on this planet that has actually escaped human impact. Even right here in the Seychelles, in Aldabra, one of the most remote places on the planet, we're still seeing plastic pollution, and they're actually experiencing a massive coral bleaching event right here, right now. The more that we advance technology, the more critical it is that we use that technology responsibly. To show a little bit of the tech that we're using here on board Ocean Explorer, we're going to turn it over live to one of our submersibles, where Dr. Diva Amon is standing by. Diva is a marine biologist with the Benioff Ocean Science Lab at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a World Economic Forum friend of Ocean Action. Diva, can you hear us? What are you seeing? Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Hello, Sam. So at the moment, as with every Zoom call, especially I guess those that are about 300 meters below the surface, <laughs> there's always connectivity issues. Uh, but right now, there are a lot of people on board working very hard, not only to get that feedback up, but also to make all of this happen, including all of the work that we're doing subsea at the surface in this area. Take a look at how we pulled this amazing feat off. Throughout history, humanity has endeavored to communicate across vast expanses. From smoke signals and carrier pigeons to email and FaceTime, we've tirelessly pursued ways to connect. Advancements in technology have propelled us further, enabling communication beyond our planet. We've beamed messages deep into the cosmos, communicating with distant spacecraft. And yet, the most challenging frontier of communication isn't space. It's right here in our oceans. So Dave, why is wireless communication so challenging in the water? It's so challenging because radio frequency does not work under the water. Water is so much more denser than air. As soon as you hit the water, no radio signal will penetrate that. Right. What we've got to do is use acoustic communications, so sound through the water. Much like how cetaceans, whales and dolphins would talk. Does that mean that if I was in the water, I'd be able to hear what was being communicated between the subs? Yes, you'd be able to hear something, maybe not the actual comms, but you'd definitely be able to hear something. Okay. Acoustics is great for voice communications, but it has its limitations. To get full-blown data transmission and video transmission, you need to do it differently. The solution is light. Here on the sub, we have our um, optical modem equipment. We have the LED array. Uh, so this is the transmit function, and this is the um, receive function, so that just detects the light in the water. So we convert the, the camera image and the comms to data, and then that's transmit, receive through the water using light. And so once it gets into these, then how does it get to the ship? So that's where the ROV comes in. So once the signal leaves the sub, ends up here, what happens? We're above the sub and we've got the same arrangement on here, so we've got transmitter and receiver here. We're receiving and transmitting exactly the same as they are. Yeah. So the light from the, from the sub is getting picked up on this one, right. and the light pulses are then getting packeted okay. and turned into data. So it comes all the way through our 6,000 6, meters of cable, from there down into mission control, up to the satellite, and down to, down to Davos which is like a 70,000 kilometer journey in a matter of seconds. Yes, and that's, the, that's it, it's all about light. See, uh, it is no easy feat to create this kind of okay, communication. Okay, so as I mentioned... Maddie, it's all you, we're gonna get this right, as go I ahead. As I mentioned... <laughs> Thank you, Sam, sorry for the delay, we're a bit far away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So as I mentioned, as I mentioned, this is no easy feat to pull off, and Diva has been standing by, ready to let us know what she's seeing underwater. Diva, are you there? Can you hear us? Hi, Matsi, can you hear me? Great. Okay, well, hello, Sam. Hello, panelists. Hello to everyone joining us from around the world and in Davos. So we are down here at 340 meters depth, and we have a snow as well. But I imagine that the similarities to Davos end there, right? So we are actually sitting in complete darkness, we're feeling 30 atmospheres of pressure, so 30 times what you're feeling in Davos. And we are sitting on this absolutely enormous wall. And we decided to come down here to explore this wall because last night we generated these incredible maps of the south side of Aldabra for the first time. And we just saw these incredible walls extended right from the shallow coral reefs all the way down to the deep sea. So we really want to come down and see what they look like in person. And when we've gotten down here, there are caves full of fish. They're layered, just full of animals. It is absolutely incredible. And you know, with any sub dive, even for a seasoned scientist like me, it is a nerve wracking, but really exciting experience. And that's just because you have no idea what it is you're going to see. The ocean is so unexplored and it's always changing. But it isn't all fun and games down here. You know, those sharks, the snappers aside, we are actually doing science. And so Seychelles Wild Scientists and OceanX are collecting critical baseline data from around Aldabra that they're going to use to inform future conservation. And that means getting down here, getting eyes on the seafloor, collecting high definition imagery, collecting environmental DNA, collecting samples, and really allowing us to begin to know, begin to understand, and begin to value incredible places like Aldabra. But, you know, these technological breakthroughs, sure, we had a little, a little jig earlier, but I am coming to you from 350 meters depth. Those technological breakthroughs aren't just essential for science, they are also essential for communication. So if you cast your mind back, 1969, Apollo 11 streamed live the lunar landing at nearly 400,000 kilometers from Earth. Now fast forward 54 years later, and here we are coming to you from about half a kilometer below the surface of the ocean. And, and really, this is one of, the, one of the few manned live broadcasts from the deep sea to ever take place. And what we're hoping happens is that just like in the last century, that space exploration really just pushed people to, to, to just uh, to really, you know, enjoy, the, be enamored with space. We're hoping that ocean exploration coming to you, sharing this last frontier of our planet, the deep ocean, really is going to inspire a new generation to care about the ocean. Back to you guys in Davos. It is very exciting to be making some history with you. I've done a lot of interesting interviews, but never one from 350 meters below the surface of the sea. Um, as you've shown us how difficult this is, why should governments and business invest in this technology, Diva? That's a really great question, Sam. And I mean, of course, there's, you know, encountering new species, encountering new habitats, encountering new behaviors. And of course, I would find that thrilling, but there has to be more, right? And innovation and technology really is going to open up this vast, unknown part of our planet and get more people engaging with it than ever before in human history. We're already seeing that happening. And that's exciting from a scientific perspective. That's exciting from a cultural perspective. That's exciting from an economic perspective. And that innovation and technology is going to be absolutely critical to using the deep ocean in the future sustainably. And that's going to be that's going to be critical, and or rather, it's going to happen because that innovation and technology is going to allow us to collect all the different puzzle pieces, whether it is maps of the sea floor, or an idea of what lives where, or an idea of how resilient animals are in the deep ocean to change. It's going to allow us to get all of those puzzle pieces, put them together, so that we can really begin to understand a good picture, a really high-resolution picture of what's actually down here. So just to give you an example of you know, how this innovation and in technology is really going to unlock the deep ocean for um, potentially governments and economies around the world to potentially allow them to benefit to the tune of billions in the future, 
deep sea life is going to be the cornerstone of a sustainable deep ocean blue economy. So when we think about it, there's marine genetic resources, animals down in the deep sea, they have evolved at a very extreme conditions, or at least extreme to us, whether it is high temperatures, low pressures, sorry, high pressures, low temperatures, darkness, and that means that they could have some really interesting compounds within their body that we could ultimately benefit from for pharmaceuticals, for nutraceuticals. Hey, we could be getting new antibiotics from the deep sea in the future. Then there's biomimetics. That's innovation taking inspiration from deep sea animals. There are currently new textiles that are being developed from hag, taking inspiration from hagfish slime. Yes, hagfish slime. And then when you think about it, there's tourism, there's the fact that, you know, if you text, if you FaceTime, if you Zoom, if you Google cat videos, that is as a result of the submarine cables that crisscross the seafloor already. So really, we are looking at an entirely new potential economy or many potential new economies coming from the deep ocean in the future. There is no doubt about it. The deep sea and the hundreds of thousands of species that live here are the potentially going to help us solve some of the greatest challenges to face humanity in the future. And that will only be possible with the help of innovation and technology. Thank you, Diva. I can't get over the fact that we've got four feet of snow out the window and we're talking to you under the sea. Um, what exactly does a sustainable ocean economy look like to you, Diva? That's a, that's a really great question. And, um, you know, there are a lot of key components that need to, need to be put into place. So, for instance, a sustainable deep ocean blue economy has to have precaution. There is so little that we know about the deep ocean right now that we need time to collect the science. And so it's another thing. The sustainable deep ocean blue economy should be grounded in science, and that requires time. We also, it should also have a lot of stakeholder engagement. We heard from Jennifer, we heard from David, we heard from others how important that is. And also there should be informed decision making, right? And what I will say is that all of those things are, are absolutely essential. And what a sustainable deep ocean blue economy does not look like is the unrestrained and rapid rush to mine the deep ocean in the absence of good governance, in the absence of good science, in the absence of stakeholder engagement. So really we have a lot of work to do still before we can begin to really tap into this in a sustainable way. Last question for you, Diva, uh, which I think ties into this whole conversation. How do we use the ocean without using it up? Great question. Um, I mean, as you've heard already, there is good reason for concern, especially when we're talking about the deep sea. I think David touched on this earlier. Um, the fact that the deep ocean is very slow, stable. Animals live for extremely great ages. Just earlier today, actually, right now, I'm looking at a beautiful Leopathy's black coral. We know they can live for over 4,000 years. We know that there are sponges in the deep ocean that live for over 10,000 years. And animals that take that long to, or can live for that long and take that long to reproduce, do not recover from impact well or easily. So there's a lot that we have to think about to make sure that we don't use it up in the deep ocean because it is so susceptible to impact. But there are a lot of things that we can do to help minimize this with the help of technology, exploration, science. And that means take the time gather that critical data, really shit, and then take that and share it with decision makers at all of these ongoing governance processes that are deciding of the fate of the ocean right now, whether it is the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction negotiations at the UN or at the International Seabed Authority on mining, um, climate cop, and so on. But, but I mean, technology, science, that will only get us so far when it comes to decision making. Ultimately, there are a few more things we can do. So we need to ensure that more people know and understand the deep ocean, its life, and it's important. Ray already alluded to this. The ocean is truly global, and so all of humankind, not just a few, should be able to engage and, um, and really help to inform the decisions that are being made. We also need to think really critically about how people especially, especially the most ocean dependent people are connected to the deep ocean and what that means for designing policy measures. And lastly, I think, I'm not sure who said this on the panel, apologies, but I think what really does need to improve is we need decision makers who are willing to listen and have the will to create positive change. Because I think that's something that 
just we need to see a lot more in today's world. Um, and so with the deep ocean, I think that a lot of that is coming to, to really to listen to experts, to those who know and understand the risks that could potentially, or the risk to the deep sea, I should say. Um, and speaking of experts who know and understand the deep sea, I'm going to throw us back to Maddie. Maddie, can you hear me? Awesome. Thank you so much, Diva. That was great. I really appreciated hearing your panel responses. And to the other panelists as well, I think we're hearing a theme here, um, and it's one that's very strong in ocean science and policy in general, which is um, data-driven, science-based policymaking is a requirement for future ocean conservation measures. In a lot of places, there are extreme data limitations, um, and that's why I'm really excited to showcase another technology that we're developing and utilizing on board, which really allows us to get at that data limitation um, and to add more and more data um, about the biodiversity of the ocean at the molecular level. It's called environmental day and DNA or eDNA, and I'm really excited to show you how we use it on board. Take a look. The oceans are home to an infinitely complex web of life, from microscopic plankton drifting with the currents, to enigmatic predators lurking in the abyss, even to the largest animals ever to exist on our planet. Identifying that dizzying array of creatures may seem impossible, but science has an ace up its sleeve, DNA. Environmental DNA is the genetic material that species leave behind as they move throughout the water. We can collect environmental DNA with water samples or out of sediment, pull the DNA out of it, and basically ask the DNA sample a whole bunch of questions. Using the cutting edge technology on board Ocean Explorer, we're able to generate a report of all the species that exist in that sample. You start to get this really robust picture of the biodiversity in an area, and you can just use water. The main advantage of the eDNA and molecular ecology approach is speediness. You will get the full picture of the community within a week. Ocean Explorer's capability to do this type of analysis is unique in the world. What once had to be done in advanced laboratories on shore can now be done in real time at sea collecting samples, taking them immediately to the lab, doing the immediate DNA extractions, and then immediately putting them on the sequencer and seeing what we have. What we are bringing here is the capability to in-house, anywhere in the world, sequence eDNA, analyze the data, and provide insights to the scientists on board. On board. Sequencing in a lab, on a ship, and being able to access any part of the water column from the surface all the way down to 6,000 meters, completely unheard of. We are doing the future in the present. This is five steps ahead of any other research vessel in the world. And with a global presence, OceanX is uniquely positioned to make a global impact. Ocean Explorer is moving around the oceans of the globe pretty much all the time. That allows us to paint a bigger picture of what life in the oceans looks like and help with the exploration of all the unseen stuff. What's next? Action. We are really excited to start sharing and communicating some of the results that we're getting to the world. We learn new things and new information every day because of the ability to make discovery in real time on board Ocean Explorer. With all of the amazing work that we're doing here in the Seychelles, we hope that all of the data that we're collecting is going to be a game changer for local scientists, policymakers, and decision makers, both regionally and globally. While we're here, we are going to be collecting a lot of data and taking quite a few samples as well. And actually, I'm pretty sure Diva is about to take a sample from the subs right now. Thanks, Manny. Can you hear me? Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm about to take an environment, a water sample from the sub. We're going to take this back on deck after and analyze the environmental DNA with Seychellois scientists after. And I just want to again emphasize before I do that how critical it is to get assets like this, submersible ships, other deep ocean assets into the hands, as David said earlier, of developing, country, um, of developing countries like the Seychelles where for instance, the deep ocean is 96.5% of their exclusive economic zone, and yet they do not have access. And that's such a common story for small island developing states, including my own for Nam Tobago. So, let's take the sample. Hope I don't break anything. Okay, bear with me. Okay, we are live. Boom. And there we go. 
sample that we hopefully are going to then use to help us map the biodiversity of Aldabra and really contribute to future conservation here in the Seychelles. Thanks, Maddie. Back to you. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Diva, for collecting that sample. Not everybody gets that on the first try, so much appreciated and well done. I'm really excited to take that to the lab and extract DNA from it, especially as I see you're right next to a big coral colony. <laughs> So all of the incredible technology that we've shown you here today for science and exploration um, contributes to the amazing scientific work that we do. Uh, but we also have incredible camera technology here on board that we've sent cameras down into deep, crazy, very, very intense places to capture some of the most amazing animal and geophysical and oceanographic encounters on the planet. That's really part of our mission at OceanX, which is to conduct groundbreaking scientific research, tell the story of that research and discovery through captivating media, and share that story with the world. We, as we say goodbye, we would love to share some of those stories with you. Farewell, Davos. I mean, wow, what an experience that was. And I think we all are now scientists, so I'm excited that that happened together for us today. Uh, Diva, Maddie, thank you. Ray, thank you. I'd like to invite our panelists back up onto the stage. Uh, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit about what we just saw and your, your takeaways from, from what we've just witnessed. Please join me again. All right, Jennifer, we'll start with you. Since you had the privilege of going last first. Um, what did you make of what we just saw? So first of all, incredible. Um, so everyone has supported that effort. Just And I know that you guys probably worked hundreds of hours on getting that I right. I just so. showed up. <laughs> a lot of other people worked very hard. Just just amazing what we can do if we, if we have eyes on the seas and the things that we can learn. And um, having that data is going to be so powerful. I will just say that I'm particularly excited about this because the Seychelles is a place that the Nature Conservancy has been working in for a long time with local partners. And we did the first nature bond in the Seychelles in 2016, which unlocked, which reduced the debt of Seychelles, refinanced their debt, and actually unlocked money for conservation. And in exchange, the Seychellian government agreed to protect its exclusive economic zone, an area that's the size of Germany. So this is huge impact. And now we have a place that we don't know if it's directly related, but they're for the first time in many, many, many many years seeing blue whales come back to this area. So it has real impact on what we can do at scale. We have the data, the will, the knowledge is really phenomenal. So that was terrific. Thank you. Andrew, uh, did that inspire you? Yeah, no, I, look, I absolutely loved it. Ray and I know this subject really well. Um, I published a thesis in my PhD, which is called Solutions for Troubled Ocean. Um, and we focused very hard in on what we call oceanomics, which is DNA extraction, um, and I think it is the way to really discover what's in the ocean without even having to film it. You certainly don't have to touch it, you don't have to kill it. Um, and I'd only say to other early adopters like Ray and I that, um, that uh, as I had to answer in my Viva, um, okay, if this technology gets out, um, how will you contain it? How will it not ex be used to exploit the oceans? How will it not be used to extract species at an even greater rate. And so I'd say um, what I answered my Viber was that this is really important technology. Uh, it's really, really important work. The fishing industry wouldn't do this, but if they could get hold of the data, um, they could potentially abuse it. Um, and so I'd say uh, to any explorer like Ray who, who does this, let's set a set of rules for the host government that if any species on the IUCN red list is identified, then it's automatically protected as opposed to what we all face right now as conservationists. If a species starts to get fished towards extinction, we have to fight to protect it. It could take years. It should be the fishing industry which has to fight to unprotect it. So I'd, I'd just say this is a really great tech, Ray. It's lovely to, to see you guys using it. I just am so excited by it. Um, and now I think maybe get hold of the lawyers to say, let's make sure that the fishing industry respects this data. David, how does this work or this kind of work fit within the larger scientific project? Well, I mean, it's, it's foundational in expanding that project, contributing to that project, you know, filling huge gaps of data. Um, I didn't know the ship was going to be Aldabra, in Aldabra, so I was really excited because I've been able to go there a couple of times to dive and look at the shallow coral reefs and have no idea what was down that wall uh, beyond where we couldn't go. And so seeing that was amazing. 
Um, we have huge gaps of data. We didn't even know um, the, the diversity of shallow corals in that region. For example, in the northern Mozambique Channel, this is work that we were doing about 10 years ago. Turns out it's the second peak of shallow water marine biodiversity in the world after the Coral Triangle region. And that was completely unknown before. And so, you know, we're going to fill in levels of knowledge beyond that with this. I think what I'd like to do is to, is to perhaps emphasize the, the importance of decision making, the importance of governance in technologies are wonderful and knowledge is, we need knowledge. I'm a scientist. How we use that knowledge and how we use that technology is, of course, the most important thing. And I think the, um, in, in all of these processes and moving forward, the one question I think is most important is, are we moving towards greater equity and equality? Are we making sure that the right people are in the space? You know, the Seychelles government in this case has made wonderful decisions with their marine spatial planning and moving forward. And they could do amazing things with this knowledge in deepening that protection and wise use of the resources. And of course, we need to extend that to all other ocean regions as well. And that's really invest in really making this knowledge fully open and accessible, democratized, and the decision-making to use that very well uh, would be wonderful. That's the big project that we have now in this world to really sustain our world into the future. And I think it's fantastic to see this really setting a new boundary on being able to do that. Uh, what a great note to end on. Uh, Ray and Maddie and Diva, if you're listening, uh, thank you so much to our panelists, to everyone at the World Economic Forum who made this technological feat possible uh, and to bring the work that OceanX is doing to you. Jennifer, Andrew, David, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Ray.